Perfect. Uh, hello. Um, good evening. My name is Liz Geneva. So I'm going to be doing a double act with Hugh for the next half an hour or so. Um, so what we're going to be talking about is these areas. So Hugh's going to give you an introduction to the farm and then I'm going to be running through the focus areas that I've been working with Hugh on in the last few months. And then we'll have a bit of a conversation in the next step section and then we'll do a Q&A at the end. So I'll hand over to Hugh. Thank you, Liz. Uh, 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 Ni hefyd, uh, ni'n ffan gyrmysg, ni hefyd yn tyfu rhyw chwedig um, ac ar o lafur, barlu sgwenni tha cyrch, uh, ni'n defnyddio hwnnw i'r gwartheg a mae eisiau'r gwellt yn hynny. Uh, yn draddod diadol, ni wedi bod yn gwerthu'r uh, lloi fel stores. Uh, ni wyn cafs, ym sy'n maen nhw tia uh, rhyng naw a 28 oed. Um, Ni mewn ardal eitha gwael am TB, so ni beth ni wedi bod yn edrych ar y gweithio gyda Liz yw uh, edrych i orffen, pesgu rai o'r uh, gwartheg, a felly yn symud draw i wneud hynny'n gyfan gwbl os dweithydd beth y mas. Um, mae'n tynnu'r bresiau'r ofni, achos mae'n gwmwyd y bresiau'r ymsyn ni'n unrhyw un sydd wedi cael y problem a TB a um, peil o stores i'w werthu, mae'n gwybod y bresiau'r mae hynny'n gyda'r oed yna chi. Um, so na beth ni'n un treial heimo am yn dyfodol. Um, beth ni'n dweud dychyn neud mae am bryn os uh, dwy flynau. If you can move on to the next, that's it, yeah. Uh, Na'r ffarm wedi cymeryd yn y, yn y geiaf, ddim byd ar y coed, mae'n dweud tipi mwy gwyrdd ma'n awr. Um, ni di, beth ni'n digon ffodi sydd fynd ar cwrs Mastergrass gyda Farming Connect nôl yn 2018. Uh, hyn yw'r disbarth yn nôl yn i dechrau pori cylchdroi, y rotational grazing. Uh, felly rhoi o'n i tipyn bach o mains letrig rhwng y, y bloc pori uh, yn cael yn fel y grazing platform. A eithwn ni wedi nati i um, troi'r stoc a mesur porfa a Really, you saw Messier Porva Vel uh, uh, Tuli Nishur Bunin Pori Gumit Nivod, a uh, Osma Nina Heredig and Bring, Ne Gormod, and Ne Dori Sailage, Ne Vel Lenny, I think Sihion, when you get a well, but he named Dodon Blani, has an incado Messier Divod Dave Dornod, and uh, Inclair Robert Pitini within. Um, if I can have the next one, Liz. Ie, yeah. um, ni'n fferm sych iawn, uh, ni'n arfod i'r ol, a uh, beth ni'n treial wneud achos bod ni mor sych. Um, treial arbed arian wrth cadw'r gwartheg mas trwy'r geia. Um, a llun dych chi'n rhan awr o'r gwartheg nôl yn, yn y ganol y geia a um, beth ni'n wneud wedi i'w roed strips yn y bob dydd a Gwair, ni sydd leid, gwair hapn o'n bod mewn ar llynau. A jyst symud um, y ring feeder mlaen fel bod angen. Um, Bwn ni'n cael dŵr gwartheg i gyd yn un bloc bwytheg o gwartheg fyna a rhodo ni cymysgedd o cael a um, um, uh, cael a swedes a red and turn it to get the moon to give it a then a cavala car you 13 and a half hour where cadu we stay go that and they wish got our quiet of course um so peter for an internal lady he a bit cost there um if you can have the next one this 
co um, ar yr ochr chwith mae enghraifft o fel i ni'n symud. Um, Ffens bob dydd ni'n rhoi lein lawr bob dydd o gormod reilio really, grop i ni symud i'r dros ben y byl. So, ddim ffeind jo'n rhywbeth i ni just wind o ffens lan a neud y bob dydd. A fo nhw'n cael rhyw section rhyw pedwar metr bob dydd. Beth hwn i wedi wneud wedi'n gyda health um, uh, cysylltemio hwn i wedi mesur faint o crop uh, with na pwys o fe a oedd yn rhoed yr um, dry matter i ni o'r, o'r crop gwyrdd a oedd ni'n ychwanegu i'r gwair ato fe wedyn i ni neu siŵr bod nhw'n cyrraedd uh, beth hwn oedd angen yn nhw bob dydd. So weithiodd hwnna dda iawn. Uh, Lenni nawr yn yr llun arall chi'n gweld mae Seilwyd wedi cael ei wneud fyna yn ffos cyt uh, Red Clover. Uh, red Clover Aigas le i wna yn dod i ben, mae hwnna wedi bod mewn tair mynnau. So, mae'n lle cartor pils lawr i'r clos i ffido. Nid i roed nhw ar ochr y parc yn barod am y geia. A wedyn, y plan yw wedyn, wel ni wedi wneud yw uh, gynteidwodd yr um, porfan dyn ôl, nid i sbreio fe oft a rownd up a director lo crop gwyrdd ynddo fe. Uh, Lwcus nawr mae'r glaw wedi dod a mae fe'n cydio os o gobeithio ddeithio nhw'n yn ei blan a gobeithio gawn ni grop tebyg i'r un chi'n gweld yn y slaid ar so, um, um, llun yn y top yw'r llun yw, yw'r ca le ni wedi wneud y seilwyd a mae'r bils wedi lein o lan yr or ochrau. Mae hwnna wedi cael ei gymeryd uh, digfed o chwefror 10th o febru a gath hwnna i adael dros geia ni ddim wedi cymeryd uh, uh, defed tac, ddim cwmynt a goeden ni, ddim ond yn amlech i barc. So gath hwnna i adael dros y geia achos um, sy'n gormod o um, fel chi'n gweld o'r llun cyntaf yn gormod o siedau yma. So dim ond lle i dy mewn ar wyth deg o dda i loia yn y gwanwyn sydd da fi. So o'r young stock wedi ni yn y siedau dros y geia ni wedi goffo dy mas ar un ni ar yr uh, adeg ni um, reid a dechrau um, chwefror. So o hwnna iddo nhw a fe poro nhw trwy'r cana cyn um, mynd i'r um, platform. Ond y llun arall chi'n gweld i wylod fel chi'n uh, chwefror a mawrth. A, um, chi'n cael noswaith trwy mo law. A mae'r llun y gwartheg sy'n dweud i gwybod unrhyw cael y bach o anibendol fla, ond yn gyd ni wedi wneud yw just gadael y fod. Um, ...ddwy waith arni, so mae fe'n mae e'n bosib. So, uh, dwi'n credu, mae gyd sefyd wneud am ymeiliad. I think that's all I got for now, Liz. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much, Hugh. It's the magic mute or unmute button challenges. Um, so the next bit um, we're going to talk about is the sort of focus areas that I was asked to work with Hugh on. So what I did forget in the back in the introduction is to introduce myself. So um, I'm an independent beef and sheep consultant. I'm actually based over in the East Midlands of England. Um, my background is um, sort of the technical background of fertility breeding genetics but also do a lot of work on grass and forage so um, although he was as he mentioned he's been doing quite a lot of work with precision grazing so uh, on his grassland so my job was to focus on these slightly different areas so the first thing that we're going to look at is um, is Hugh's breeding policy so he has already mentioned he's um, around about 80 cows and they're a combination of Soleil cross Hereford cross Charolais cross type cows uh, sort of uh, mature weight of just over 600 kilos so certainly not big cows um, in regards to in comparison to other ones 
uh, or other system, sorry. Um, the decision is to breed half of them with a Charolais and that's for terminal calves and they um, historically have been sold stalls or and, and we'll come on to talk about them now being sold as um, entire bulls around about 13 months of age. Um, part of the decision also in the last few months really was to the purchase of a new Solaire bull who you can see on, in the picture on the slide and that's to replace a Hereford bull that was um, doing the risk was that he was going to start going over his daughter so he was replaced with that Solaire bull and that's really to breed heifers to um, to keep within the herd and to carve down at two years. So that's the sort of uh, current breeding structure. Um, so it's quite interesting that very specific bull for terminal and another bull for maternal rather than trying to get one bull to do both jobs and also uh, keep uh, breeding your own replacements to and in terms of the advantages from a health status perspective. So in terms of from a key performance indicator perspective, we're just going to run through um, some of the numbers from Hugh and also compare them with industry targets. So the first thing, and so fundamental really for a suckler cow system is calves born per 100 cows served. And at the moment, uh, Bryn is at around about 92%. Uh, industry target is greater than 95 and we'll talk Hugh and I'll talk well have, when we do a bit more chat in a bit we'll talk about that and partly Hugh puts um, quite a few cows to the bull knowing full well that he's going to cull some of them out um, even if they are in calf so that's what's um, affecting some of those numbers uh, so the the divider is a is a bigger number than actually he's going to he's planning to take round to calving um, so and in terms of that's also linking on to the, that next figure, which is carved weaned, sorry, calves weaned per hundred cows um, served. And that again is taking a measure of the, of the mortality between those two points. Industry target being 94 and Hughes around about 87 this year. I've put it in italics because obviously we haven't quite weaned yet. So never, it's always slightly um, touch wood. Um, so in terms of, and Hughes already mentioned this real focus on carving period. So the ambition is for 10 weeks and certainly from an industry target perspective we're looking at below 12 and quite a good proportion of farms don't achieve that below 12 target so it's a really it's a really nice thing to focus on um, many reasons it tries to equal out weaning weight also means that labor is focused in terms of a period of time and it means that those batches are, are more even in terms of any form of treatment or management which mean they're more even in terms of age and generally it also means that a one weaning date can occur without potentially affecting those younger born animals. In terms of empty cows again industry target less than five Hughes just uh, for this last season was 4.7 um, so again we're um, I mean it's always a target always something everybody's looking forward to to, to reduce that number of empty cows but um, probably also a consequence of that tight or going for that tight period as well so that is um, a co potential consequence of that that if if those cows have been given an extra two weeks they may have got in calf but that doesn't fit that vision in terms of compact calving period and then calf mortality during pregnancy is around about four percent which is higher than that industry target would like and what a, a, some of the debate that comes in is between as Hugh has outlined that system between those those cows are only in for a relatively small amount of the time um, and so is that system between putting extra stress on those animals and is that's what's is that's what's causing that high mortality it is we also have to think about the trade-off of the costs that are being saved because of that system so in a perfect world we would want that number to be lower and i'm not saying it is due to the fact of how those how those cows are outwintered but we have to think about it as a as a whole system in terms of actually by the wintering system he has putting those cows onto forage crops um, and to be having them in for a minimum amount of time and turned out when those calves are between less than a week old um, he's minimizing those housing housing costs for the for those car um, for those cows sorry so as, as hopefully we shall see so these are um, this is a video of the bulls from uh, the ones that have just gone sort of they were being slaughtered out Feb, March, April uh, and as Hugh said earlier which is a lot of this was the sort of hedge bets in terms of the risk of going down with a positive TB test and the issues in terms of selling from that point. Um, so in this sort of uh, trial really 15 of those um, at the moment all those bulls are left entire 
at calving and then a decision is taken to castrate them as they come into an autumn time. So the decision was then taken not to castrate 15 of them and then to see how that system would work uh, on Hughes Farm. Uh, and then its feed was introduced November, December time. And I think the reflection back on that system is that feed should have gone into those animals sooner than that. And that transition period is something really to focus on for this year. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But that transition onto that sort of more grass based diet onto these more intensive rations does need to be managed quite carefully to ensure that those growth rates were achieved. Um, but we'll look at doing some, some of those growth rates that those bulls were achieving in I mean, some were, I mean, top ones were doing over two kilos a day in terms of growth rate. So once they were on that feed, um, they were, the performance was very high. It's just the transition that we need to focus on. Um, also, Hugh is running a small trial uh, this year for taking um, steers through the system. So for almost for a second grazing season. So instead of selling them in that winter spring time, he's kept some on and he's grazing them um, to see how that, that system also performs, again, as a, a way of, um, potentially hedging uh, against not selling due to TB. We need to do that again. Um, uh, and so in terms of what we've got here is also some key performance indicators for the system of selling bulls versus stalls. So what we've got here in, is the first thing is, as you can imagine, this very intensive feeding sort of system the bit that is high cost is the feed so we're, what we're trying to do is not limit production but also have a balance in terms of what feed is being fed the calculation for this system was a, um, about 1.2 tons per head that Br uh, Bryn fed the industry's target would be about 1.7 so this is something between it's possibly connected to that transition phase um, and so again it will something to monitor for the future in terms of how much uh, feed is being fed to those animals but certainly as you will talk about later which is by the time they were going off the farm they were certainly eating a fair amount um, so in terms of the average age of slaughter in months for those animals was just under 13 and again that industry target is between 12 to 14 um, we run into challenges under 12 because of the so I mean the class really is rosé veals um, and then certain processes will have limits in terms of age and normally over 15 months they won't be allowed going through as prime animals so that you know, it's a very tight um, age schedule for those animals to be produced to the average live weight at slaughter for Hughes bulls was three uh, 620 kilos and the industry target would be about 630 so slightly below um, um, but not outrageous and then that linked in through to a slightly lower average carcass weight um, and links through again in terms of that killing out percentage I'll talk about in a minute. So the average carcass weight for those animals were 344 four kilos compared to 360 and a slightly lower killing out percentage. These, I should have said, these industry's targets are, are um, for suckler bred animals. And so some of the influence of that Hereford genetics could be the reason why that killing out percentage is slightly lower. And certainly you did see that difference between the Charolais crosses and the Hereford cross of bull going through those systems. Um, so in terms of the percentage in spec, so he was hitting 93 just because of the mass. That's one animal that was slightly um, on the uh, lower on the fat, but I'll talk that through in a second. And again, industry average is really over 90%. We know that probably across the whole industry, less than about 55-ish percent of those animals are hitting spec. So certainly on an individual farm that's really focusing on that high spec, um, we're aiming to get over 90% of those animals in that target. Um, so the abattoir that Hugh was sending his bulls to uses a 15 point scale so we're generally more used to the EU ROP and one to five for fat levels but within this abattoir they break down those different scores into three so for example you have E plus E equals and E minus um, so it just expands the grid and sort of gives you more options um, of where those animals fit so on this image here anywhere in the red is um, less well the market doesn't really have a place for it it's more challenging to sell within the market and that's when you're going to get pence reductions the sort of amber area is that it's sort of there's markets for it but it's not quite as saleable anywhere hitting the green there is a market for it and yes we have to think about in terms of carcass weight targets but certainly EURP so running down here is confirmation and running along here is fat so anywhere in this sort of green zone so that's from a sort of two equals up to a four equals on this grid um, and down to a sort of O plus 
um, in terms of confirmation. So the black circle, I should have said, is um, where Hughes bulls hit. So they're all, those animals are all in within that black circle. And so most of them were in the green and there was a few, that particular one was a bit more into the, into the amber, but certainly as a group of bulls, really high um, hit rate in terms of market spec. Um, so yes, yeah, so that was interesting to see where they fitted within that. So you know, there could have been um, that slight push in terms of making them slightly fatter, but that's associated with them being on farm longer and having higher costs in terms of feed. So certainly there is always a trade-off in terms of that fat level. Um, and certainly when he was having a chat with the process that was taking them and the challenge with young bulls is some processors don't always like them. So it's definitely worth having a conversation with them before you start that system. And that the target is really to get them over 600 kilos live weight. And, and, that, and that's the sort of target that he was heading for. So what we did in this system is we then looked at a bit of a partial budget. So then looked at the costs associated with this. So as partial budgets work, um, we look at income foregone. So that's income we've lost. So in this example, we, we've lost some store sales and we've lost some straw sales. So Hugh retains his straw, but obviously this was used to keep those animals in that shed for a bit longer. And we've got some additional costs associated with those bulls. So we've got some feed costs in, in from blend bought in, we also got some roll barley from Hughes Farm. And we've got some a minor additional vet and med costs. So that gives us a total, total sort of losses for just under 14,000. Then we know, then we look at additional income. So obviously we've got the bull sales and those animals average just over a thousand pounds each. Um, and then we've got some additional benefits. Obviously that straw is being used on that farm and then that's additional, sorry, that's additional FYM used um, for, within that arable system so there is some value to that so the difference in terms of using selling them as stalls versus finishing them at bulls the difference was working out at just over 1600 pounds for that enterprise so for 15 animals going through so just over 100 pounds per bull so then that led us to the conversation about this sort of strategic use of creep um, so the so the rough plan and we'll we'll talk about it a bit more is that this idea of actually getting those bulls particularly onto um, more intensive rations earlier so as they transition onto that harder feed at grass rather than when they come into the shed could potentially make that transition period um, smoother so the plan is to at the moment is to introduce that creep when the bulls are removed to stop them destroying the creep feeders and um, the calf weight will be collected at that point and then the plan was to put to split the cows with bull calves into one gang and the car and the cows with heifers into another gang and feed only creep to those into the bull calves but again that plan is fluid in terms of the performance benefits that we might see from those heifer calves um, the mix that's being used is homegrown rolled barley and oats um, and of those 75 calves 34 are bulls and again the decision will be to not cut the better performing of those animals and put them into a bull beef, bull beef system this winter. So what we have to think about in terms of creep is that by about four months of age, half of that, uh, the feed requirements of that calf is met by something that isn't milk, so grass concentrates or silage. And the debate is actually, as those animals get better at feeding themselves, should we, I mean, it's more efficient to feed them direct rather than feeding a cow that then feeds them in terms of milk. We also have to take advantage to, of that maximum feed conversion that's occurring in the, when they're younger. And the general rule of thumb is that by introducing creep, we can um, increase weaning weights by about 25 kilos. Do there's other factors associated with that? So um, in terms of other forage quality, parasites, trace elements, I mean, there's other health factors that can affect that. But um, with a good wind, that's what we're aiming to do, an extra 25 kilos. And because of that efficient feed conversion efficiency, a feed conversion efficiency, I can't say it, conversion efficiency, um, about four to one. So if every four kilos of creep we feed, we're am the ambition is to get a kilo of gain back. And that's what is the advantage of feeding them that seals in a younger age. The debate that we've got is about, um, because Hugh is selecting his own replacement heifers from within that herd, we have to also just make sure, and that's why it's important to collect some weights prior to that, if the creep is going to heifer calves. So we're not we're not sort of ignoring the milkiness of the mothers so when if we creep heifer calves we just need to make sure they are um, being selected from those high milk lines rather than the ones that have benefited from the addition of creep 
again we did the same principle for um, strategic use of creep so what is the what is the cost associated is there any income foregone in this example not really there's some additional costs that we've associated with have been about four tons of um, cereals going in that could have been potentially sold there might need to be some um, vitamin, um sort of mineral mix as well that goes into that so the so the sort of cost to that business is around about 600 pounds um, we're assuming the the value is we've got we're roughly at two kilos of a live weight um, 25 kilos over 34 calves gives a value of about 1700 pounds in terms of additional income that could be taken if those animals are sold at stores at that point or um, the other advantage that we're trying to take advantage of too many advantages uh, is that they're actually going to be in the shed fewer days so that's also the big um, selling point of this point is of this strategy is you've got bigger calves going in to the shed and therefore they'll be in that shed for fewer days and therefore saving costs assuming about one pound fifty um, just because they're on that sort of higher intensity diet so that difference is just under two thousand pounds for that system so that's why doing creep is very easily justifiable in those systems so what i'll do now is bring hugh in just to have a quick chat through these sort of next steps so this is what i've sort of outlined for that he might be busy doing but he might have a different view um so it's it's sort of evaluating that transition isn't it to get those calves onto creep thinking and getting some weights off them and then monitoring that creep usage is quite an important element of that over the next few months yeah, I mean, uh, we've got, uh, I think it's a week tomorrow that the polls come out. So we'll, we'll run everything through the um, crush and weigh them. As you say, it's a good way. Then we're not hiding uh, any heifers. Uh, you know, we're not masking the heifers performance then by yeah. feed. Um, and uh, I haven't actually weighed, never weighed them this, this time of year before. I usually weigh it weaning. So it's, it's a big good indication of how things are going. It's been, you know, it's been quite a tough uh, spring after, it, you know, uh, the, the wet weather passed. It, we had this uh, quite a prolonged period and being down on the coast here, we were really struggling for a while. Uh, but luckily we were, you know, uh, we, we, the rain came and we were measuring grass so we knew we were going to run out so we, we, we did feed for about a fortnight for the for one bunch of cows um, if we I think if it had stayed dry as dry as that uh, up to now we would have already started creep feeding because you know we would have been yeah. in problems but um, yeah I think uh, it's as it is now, we, we we're in abundance of grass, so we we'll we'll just keep an eye on things and and how we get how they're getting through the grass in the next few weeks, and then decide when to start creeping. And then the I suppose also that the slightly low grass situation happened would have been peak bulling as well, wouldn't it? In terms of that's the other slight awkwardness of the timing as well. But yeah, in terms yeah. of cows looked well. I suppose you you intervened, didn't you, before they ran out of grass as well? You managed it, so they were. There was feed there for them. Yeah, Just, yeah, yeah. We we didn't want them to. You know, obviously, we don't want them to run short when when when, you're, when they're bullying, and and uh, so we made sure that they had enough in front of them, and then we kept them tight in in small paddocks, uh, kept feeding them bales nearly to requirement, and just kept moving them on so that the grass would come back nicely behind them. So um, yeah, that's what we did at the time. Yeah. And in terms of, um, so that decision, so what, in terms of, I've also written sort of in the next six months, so up until I suppose um, Christmas time-ish. Um, so you, when would you generally be scanning your cows? Uh, I usually scan the cows um, quite early, six to eight weeks after pulling the bulls out. So, so can, that needs to be moved up into the next three months, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, I do it quite quickly, to be honest. As soon as my... Uh, Scanning man has come back from New Zealand. <laughs> That's one of his first jobs when he comes back. So, um, um, yeah, I do that. Then, then you know, if we've got, if we run into some, obviously, when you when you change in bulls, you do keep an eye on on the cows, and um, but we we hope for the best. And um, if if he's missed a few, then we you can 
do something about it quickly instead of waiting till late autumn. Yeah, no, makes sense. So I don't know, we'll just flick that onto the Q&A session. So I'm not sure if any questions have come in for either of us. Thank you, Hugh and Liz. Um, does the audience have any questions at all? I'll send you a question now, or can I hate that? So do you please send them out at our Q&A now or snow hit place? Um, and now that Liz and Hugh and myself. Oh, we have one. Okay, so the first question, Liz and Hugh, what is your target for kilograms weaned per calf? What is this as a percentage of cow weight? Yeah, well, we, we are aiming for the 50% of cow weight. We have weighed the cows, so we are uh, uh, target weight uh, for kilogram. Uh, oh, there's our target weight. The, I think the, um, yeah, so we're aiming for the better steers. I think we were up to, you know, uh, 290, 300 kilos. And from there down to about 260 for the heifers. Yeah, which is still the 1.2, 1.3 kilos a day sort of range, isn't it, on that performance? Um, so the challenge with that percentage of cow weight, so it's it is quite challenging and i think use system because of that slightly smaller cow compared to other sort of suckler types is that it is easier to get to that 50 percent but in a lot of systems the challenge is to get to sort of over 45 percent of that so this number is um, kilos of calf weaned divided by uh, the average weight of that of the cows on the farm and that's how you get to a percentage and generally yeah it's quite challenging in, in a lot of suckler systems to get over 45 percent okay thank you liz um, the second question which has just come in now um do you add protein to the barley oats for the creep feed um that we don't usually uh, add anything because of the reason that uh, you know there's a fair bit of protein in the grass especially when we um with with the uh, good grass that's available now so um no we obviously will do when we um uh, make the ration if it, for the bulls yes yeah thank you um killing out percentage can be very variable depending on gut fill when we're targeting 57 percent is that gut full or gut empty interesting question <laughs> so a lot of the time it would um reality is though it will be uh, with some gut fill because it's most farms will not get to the point of emptying those animals out before they're weighed so there will be some gut fill in there but killing out percentage i i know far everybody loves talking about killing out percentage but for that very reason it's a really variable thing to chase um and so then between other people would be looking um at sort of live weight gain per day and then other people would be looking at carcass gain based on what their sort of historical killing out percentage would be i think the key factor at a farm level is that it's the way that you do it is the same so that's the, always the challenge of comparing yourself with an industry target but you can potentially look within that farm of what was happening last year if the way you do it is the same but most of the time it would have some gut fill in it yes Douglas. um this is a question for who what is your stocking density I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. I'm not. Um, I, th I think livestock. Uh, I did it worked out the other day. I think livestock units per hectare, which is sort of that, is about is about one point five, one point six, something like that. Okay, great deal. Um, when overwintering outside, is there a lot of waste during wet weather grazing eighty cows? Behind Find one fence. I, I, I don't feel there is. Um, giving them how much we were giving, I, I will admit that you know that some of the fields are light and sandy and um, no I, I, I was not disappointed with that. I think that clear up was pretty good for, for the weather we had. And, the, and that on that one it raises a really important point of field selection or site selection for that crop is that it is it's the 
free draining nature of that field is very, very important also it's sort of location in terms of it needs to be able to be like dried out by the wind so near woods or things like that can be quite challenging to keep it um to get it to dry out over that period the other thing to remember is to have is to ensure a good run out run off so sorry run back even not a good run off that's not what you're trying to do um so good run back and also if you're if it has at all any slope on it um it, that's when it's even more important to have that run back to make sure that if there is any runoff um it is captured by that um probably grass that's there great thank you liz um question i sent them by i've remembered one more thing sorry um and also as q did which is to have a very long feed face so it means that the cattle can spread out rather than having quite a concentrated area sorry no no problem um rotation um in part of arable rotation um in in a good uh, interview well temporary grass well uh, um, dry grass technique was the walls to be thought how it in um, a husband in director law need to want to be a lot of lavish or something other in director law pop it name and ready so need to ready to be or stay on there um, in in base or rotation live with an ingathical um, pioneer crop or a pioneer green crop, a glyer porva land, wedding minoli lavir, a wedding either a uh, long um, four year lay wedding or um, potty. Right, still hill. Um, you mentioned that you, that you monitor grass growth. Can you give an idea on how much grass growth you normally get? An average idea? Uh, well, it's. It, this year we, we've had a massive fluctuation um you know kilograms dry mat uh, might be uh this year i would have thought fluctuating from 20 to i would say 80 at, uh, in the last week per day uh, our average uh, demand uh, across the whole of the of, of the uh, cows is we need 50 we need 50 a day so that's when we were when we were um Heading below that, you know, and into a not not enough to uh, make demand. That's when we started feeding. Great, yeah, um, The next question: What is your opinion on grazing brassicas without fiber? Um, that is hay or silage. A question for for Liz, perhaps. Um, so yeah, the guidance is very much to maximum of seventy percent of that diet to come from brassicas, and so the and so that. To be made up from silage straw or hay could potentially be grass run back um, and the reason for that is um, that brassicas can be lacking in fiber and therefore it affects how those animals ruminate so i know there has been some work done in ireland and other places where they have pushed that brassica amount up so they haven't necessarily put any supplementary feed in um, the other challenge we've got in that situation, particularly for suckled cows, is you're feeding too rich a diet for them. They don't necessarily need all that energy and protein during that phase. Um, so it's also of balancing out that diet um, to avoid them getting a bit too fat before they lead up to calving. Um, but certainly the advice would very strongly be to have a fibre source alongside a decent water source in that field with them. Okay, great. Thank you, Liz. Um, the next question is for who? What are your plans for the future? Looking at um, keeping more, um, if I can keep more of the young stock forward and to fatten them here, what we I'd like to try this year is to, after some winter barley will come off shortly, I uh, would like to try and put a, a herbal lay in and use that as a separate grazing platform then for young stock next year and hopefully um, i've seen other people have quite good results with that um, and hopefully um, fatten off that even if, if if we can't quite make it by the end of um, the summer perhaps we can add some cereals into them to get them away yes. um, and the final question i think for this evening 
Um, would stocking rates be better assessed by live weight of cattle per hectare as opposed to livestock units per hectare? Well, I've got a confession because I misremembered the number. So now Hugh's told me, reminded me of what the demand was of 50 kilos of dry matter per hectare. That equates to about two and a half livestock units per hectare, which would be, if we know of any spring block dairy system, would be very similar to that. It also equates along to a, just over th nearly three and a half cows per hectare. My preference uh, is generally to do it on a demand perspective. So kilos of dry matter per hectare requirement of that stock because it's really easy to compare and contrast it with growth rates. Um, but you can, and then also the, you get a bit confused if you're doing it per hectare per acre and in not in the situation of you, but in a mixed situation where you've got sheep and cows, it's a lot easier to do it in a demand. So kilos of dry matter per hectare. Um, but you can, there is a nice variety of them you can choose from, but certainly um, my preference is demand. Okay, thank you very much, Liz. Um, so, yeah, er mwyn clo i hynno, um, so ni'n hoffi eich atgoffach i eto o'r gwasanaethau sydd gan cyfeithfermio ar gael. Um, mae'n creu sy'n chi gysylltu fyny os oes gynnych chi unrhyw ymoliadau, anglinau unrhyw fath o wasanaethau ni'n gynnig. Um, fel nes i sôn ar cychwyn, mae creu sy'n chi ymweld ag wefan cysylltfermio a mae'n allau ar iawn wybodaeth ar gael ar y wefan honno. Um, hefyd hoffwn ni at, atgoffach chi bod diweddariadau ar y prosiect yma yn bryn a hefyd ar weddill um, rhwydwaith ar ddangos cysylltfermio ar gael ar y wefan dan y tab Awr Farms. Um, felly sydd chi eisiau dilyn progres y prosiect yma neu unrhyw un o brosiectau eraill cysylltfermio um, mae honno yn, yn, yn rhywle da, da iawn um, er mwyn gallu gweld wybodaeth yna. Um, Jyst gadael chi wybod mi fydd copi o'r webinar yma ar gael ar er, webinar cysylltfermio yn fuan yr er recording o hynno. Um, felly sydd chi eisiau mynd yn ôl at rhywbeth mae'n creu sydd chi'n wneud hynny. Um, a hefyd hoffwn na atgoffa pawb os fedrwch chi plis lenwi'r ffurflen adborth fi na ar y diwedd ar ôl chiadal webinar. Um, Mae'r wybodaeth bod ni'n gasglu yn y ffurflen yma yn ddefnyddiol iawn ar gyfer chynllunio, ar gyfer webinar sy'r dyfodol. Um, er mwyn sicrhau bod ni'n gallu cynnig y, y profiad gorau i chi fel mynychwyr. Um, ac felly dim ond yr oes gen i'r ôl i ddweud ydy diolch y fawr iawn hynno i'r siaradwyr uh, Liz a Hugh am ymuno hefo ni, a hefyd diolch i chi fel mynychwyr am, am ymuno hefo ni yn y webinar hynno ac am eich cwsio yna, um, diolch fawr iawn i chi gyd.